Tonight's program is part of a Cities Cycling Roadshow series organized by the National Association of City Transportation Officials, a group many of you know as NACTO. NACTO has rounded up some of the best transportation planners and engineers from around the country to help us identify better biking solutions that will work in Atlanta and Decatur. In practice, I'm sorry, at the Blank Family Foundation, our trustees challenge us to innovate constantly. In practice, this means we're always seeking innovative solutions that enable communities to achieve results and go beyond what seems possible today. We are thrilled to see so many biking innovations, solutions for better biking, and we're looking forward to being part of the many new solutions in Atlanta. Some of those new solutions are starting right here at Georgia Tech. In the last year, Georgia Tech has adopted an innovative bike share program called Via Cycle and the universities invested more than $200,000 in bicycle infrastructure. More than 5% of the campus population is already using bicycles for their daily commute. Thanks to these efforts, this week, the League of American Bicyclists recognized Georgia Tech as a silver level bike friendly university. Added to Emory University's bronze ranking, Atlanta is now the only city in the country with two bike-friendly universities. Congratulations to Georgia Tech President Bud Peterson for all of these wonderful biking innovations. The successes at Georgia Tech can and should inspire all of us to make similar commitments around the community to better biking. Exciting things are happening at the city of Atlanta as well. I'm pleased this evening to introduce James Shelby, Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Community Development. From the Beltline trails to the new bike lanes coming soon along the streetcar and in Midtown, the city of Atlanta is opening up new opportunities for active transportation. We're especially excited by the transformation underway at Ponce de Leon, where the city is creating safe access for walkers and bikers. And just a couple of blocks away from here, the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition, Midtown Alliance, and Georgia Tech are partnering to connect two previously disconnected segments of bike lanes at Fifth Street. We appreciate Mr. Shelby's leadership on all of this work, and we look forward to what's coming next. So please join me in welcoming James Shelby. Good afternoon, or good evening. It all depends on if you're in the south or the north. <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed these uh, sessions today, and I know there's uh, more good topics on the agenda tomorrow. And words can express how honored the city of Atlanta to have the Cities for Cycling Road Show here uh, this year. And I want to thank Josh Mello in my office for putting this together for us. And of course, I know there was other people that was assisting him, uh, ARC and others. Uh, Ms. Ms. Cerner was also uh, helping with this uh, program. Tonight, I have the, dis the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Nicole Freeman. Uh, tonight, uh, Ms. Freeman brings uh, her vast experience and knowledge of active transportation from the city of Boston, where she serves as the director of bicycle programs. She is a key part of Mayor Manino's vision for healthy, sustainable communities and neighborhoods. Boston Bike seeks to make Boston a world-class cycling, bicycling city by creating safe and inviting conditions for all residents and visitors. Ms. Freeman is dedicated to improving infrastructure for city cycling with the goal of making biking a main street activity in Boston. Since the launch of Boston Bikes in 2007, Ridership in the city has more than doubled. Many other important strides have been made in safety, education, and facilities. 
Ms. Freeman has a degree in urban planning from Stanford University, and she worked for the university's transportation department while launching a very successful professional racing career. After retiring from racing in 2006, Ms. Freeman became known as the Bike Czar. Oh, that's an interesting name. <laughs> an interesting title, at least. The Bike Czar. By the media, and she was given the challenge of taking the city of Boston from one of the worst cities for cycling to one of the best. Here's a short list of accomplishments in 2011 for the city of Boston under her leadership. She achieved bicycle-friendly community recognition from the League of American Bicyclists and Forbes and NSNBC lauded Boston for its success in transforming the city into one of North America's most bike-friendly cities. Launched a bike share system, joining only a few cities worldwide, offering bicycles to our residents and visitors as a healthy and environmentally conscious transportation alternative. She worked in and helping install its 50th mile of bike lane, notably on Massachusetts Avenue, one of the city's major thoroughfares linking diverse neighborhoods. Community bike programs like the Roll It Forward campaign bring the benefits of cycling to all neighborhoods, including low-income areas where many residents could not afford otherwise uh, to, to afford a bike. Ms. Freeman has helped over 2,500 new bike parking spaces and Boston Bikes have worked with over 10,000 young people. Without further ado, please help me welcome Ms. Nicole Freeman. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I have to admit, a little bit nervous because this is uh, a fairly large crowd. And um, as I was sitting there, I realized the last time I talked in front of such a large crowd was uh, 2001. It was the Collegiate National Cycling Championships. And um, a couple seconds before I went on, someone pulled me aside that was running the show, and he said, Nicole, by the way, there, um, the original keynote speaker actually canceled. Uh, they're expecting Robin Williams. Uh, <laughs> so they got me. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. What we're going to talk about is turning around a city, the Boston example. So uh, as was just alluded to, Boston was an award-winning cycling city when I started. We had been three times rated the worst cycling city in the country by Bicycling Magazine. <laughs> We had an international award that many people don't know about we, uh, as the worst cycling city in the world. And uh, what people don't know is they awarded this to us early because there was no one competitive with us. Yeah. So here's a date many of you probably don't remember from history. September 27th, 2007, uh, Mayor Menino launched the uh, Boston Bike Program. And he pledged to transform Boston into a world-class cycling city. And then he pointed to me and said, Nicole, work on the details. So we were off to a great start. This is a picture when we started. We had zero miles of bike lane. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration, because if you look carefully, this is the bike lane. It starts there and ends here, <laughs> 180 feet. We have creative driving techniques that many of you have heard about. And I think this photo says it all. You've got one car on one side of the yellow, another car going in the same direction on the other side of the yellow, a cyclist down the middle of the road, and she has no helmet. OK, so what does it mean to start a bike program, and where do we go? And I realized my family is actually a perfect way to describe it. So we've got myself in the top left, and I raced professionally for 12 years. And the hairier the roads were, the more cars, the happier I was. I loved it. It was a little bit of uh, exhilaration. Uh, the program is not about me. And then I look at my dad, and I realize the program is not about my dad either. For his 60th birthday, I bought him a bicycle. And uh, a couple months later, he said, Nicole, sell that thing. I'm never going to ride it. <laughs> However, the program is about my mother. She lives in the suburbs outside of Boston where there's quiet residential streets. And she bikes two or three times a week. Uh, on the flip side, she thinks I'm crazy for biking in the city because it's too dangerous for her. She would not bike in the city yet. Uh, the program is also about kids like my nephew. He lives up in the suburbs, and you'd think I'd learn, but for his birthday, I bought him a bicycle. <laughs> and he looks at it, he's like, Nicole, it's broke. I'm like, what do you mean, Archie? What do you mean it's broken? And he says, well, it needs a new battery then. 
<laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> Uh, is it, actually, you know the expression, uh, you can never forget how to ride a bike? He actually did. He is 11 now and can't ride a bike. <laughs> but the point of the story is he did, for a very short period of time, ride his bike up in the suburbs. Again, he can't ride in the city uh, because it's not safe enough. So our task is make the roads safe enough for my mom, my nephew, and people just like that to ride in the city. Ultimately, what's our goal? <laughs> It's to change culture. I, I should tell you a story, which wasn't planned, but uh, I used to train up in Bend, Oregon with a friend, and my friend and I would do these five-hour bike rides every day. And then she'd always come back. She's like, oh my god, I've got to pick up my son, and I haven't walked the dogs. Uh, five-hour bike ride, she would take the car two blocks, walk the dog behind it, and pick up her son at school. OK, so where do you start? How do you start a bike program from ground zero? And the very first thing we did was very similar to this. We hosted the Boston Bike Summit one month after starting the program. And we brought in all of the advocates from around the city. We had all of the local professionals, all of the city officials. And then we brought in some national experts. And for two days, we discussed what should we do in Boston? How can we transform the city? And out of it, we came up with some guiding principles. So number one, and I talked about this earlier, was just start already. And there was uh, advocates that had been working for 27 years at the time, uh, and nothing had happened. And we knew that we have to get things in the ground right away. We couldn't start with a long three-year master planning process for bikes, because we would lose all credibility. And uh, one thing that made me very happy, this was, uh, there was one advocate in particular, 27 years this year, was the advocate's 30th year of bike advocacy. Uh, so we gave um, her a lifetime advocacy award this year from Boston Bikes. Um, unfortunately, we were a little late because uh, she had just had uh, gender reassignment surgery, and no one recognized her. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true. Um, <laughs> So um, number two, anything we put in the ground, it had to be a very high quality project. Because everyone was watching, that we needed the credibility. Number three, there was just one of me uh, and then the mayor. Uh, we needed to build our team. And we built a core of about 600 volunteers. Uh, every city department is involved. And these other two I really like. Uh, number four is plagiarize. And I actually have two quotes from myself here, which is not standard. Um, <laughs> Many cities, many, many, many cities had gone before us. Uh, we weren't the first, and that was a good thing. And I've always said, if I never have an original idea, we will be very successful. <laughs> um, and then focus. People call all the time with ideas. Some of them are better than others. This is not an example of a good one. Um, but we really need to focus, where are we going to have the most impact? So at the end of our Boston Bike Summit, we came up with a goal. And I decided we are going to be a League of American Bicyclists, bicycle-friendly community at the bronze level in three years. And uh, Andy Clark is on the left. He's the executive director of the League of American Bicyclists. And I told this to Andy. Uh, and he, I was saying this earlier today. He's the most eloquent speaker I've ever seen. And if you Google Andy online, every photo you'll see of him is him speaking in front of a large group. And I told Andy this. I said, Andy, we're going to be a bronze level bike city in three years. And he looked at me, and he said, hmm. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so we arranged our programs around the five E's. Uh, and those of you in bike planning know that we've got just standard five E's. And I still don't understand this, because the bike planning actually started in Europe. They speak a different language, and it probably doesn't come out to E's. But um, engineering, what you put in the ground, that's your bike lanes, your bike racks, your bike share. Encouragement, events, uh, anything we can do to get people on the bicycle. Education, working with youth, working with adults, educating drivers. Enforcement, working with the police, that's one of the hardest ease that most cities don't do. Evaluation, making sure that what we do actually has impact. And then for Boston, we created a sixth E, which is equity, making sure that our program served the people of Boston uh, and not just a subset of them. So I'm pleased to say that three years later, we did hit our goal. We um, are a silver-level bike-friendly community. 
Uh, we also were, uh, and I thought this was great, Bicycling Magazine had to crawl back and they nominated us a future best city. <laughs> and we're now in the coveted top 12. Uh, and I have to say that's, a, well, I don't want it, you guys to think that's like uh, bragging about getting a B minus in home economics or anything. Uh, it, when you actually look at what this is, it's quite good. Uh, Boston is one of only a handful of East Coast cities to, to make the cut. Um, I also know that we are the only city to have gone from worst to silver in four years, and that's because we're the only city to have held worst for so long. So what have we seen? We saw a 50% increase in ridership, anywhere from 50 to 100%. The numbers vary a little bit. But we're on par now with New York City, Chicago, trailing a little bit behind Washington. And I showed this slide in Boston uh, about a year ago. And there's someone in the front row. And I'm glad it's reserved. But the front row gets a lot of the techie types, usually. Uh, and they said, well, you know, the, the numbers are too small. It's not statistically significant. So I made the font smaller, and I'm getting off the slide fast. <laughs> I've calculated a few different ways. I think this is pretty accurate. About 15 to 20,000 new bike trips every single day. Um, this year, we had even more bike trips uh, all year because the weather was so great. So I'm starting my, my new club, the Bike Program Directors for Global Warming. Uh, lastly, uh, the um, what is that group that just came out? Tri uh, not Thunderhead Alliance. Alliance, Alliance for Biking and Walking uh, just ranked Boston the number one safest city for walking and bicycling, uh, as well as the number one rank for walking and bicycling. So uh, we hit three milestones, uh, or three highlights, uh, especially this year. Number one, we launched the New Balance Hubway bike share system. And this was July 28, 2011. And uh, the greatest moment was actually not launching it, but a couple months later, uh, Commissioner Jeanette Sadiq Khan from New York City was in town in Boston. And she was doing a talk in Boston. And uh, she was saying how that New York is going to launch their bike share system in this year after Boston, uh, and how she was really excited that other cities had gone before and that they weren't first because they could learn from mistakes in Boston. Um, so I'm pleased to report back that we haven't made any mistakes, and cities always want to be first, so I didn't buy that. <laughs> okay, so um, what is bike share and how does it work? Uh, bike share, bike share is the first thing I've seen that it just transforms cities, and we started looking at bike share in 2008 when Paris launched bike share. And Paris was just like Boston at the t that time; they had a very high uh, walking, good public transit, but very little biking at the time. And they launched a massive system, and they had 54 million trips taken in two years. It's an astronomical number. And we said, OK, that's pretty good. Montreal launched bike share uh, a, a year later. And in five months, they had 1 million trips. And I think it's interesting. I work for a city. Things often happen at a glacial pace. But bike share transforms things overnight. And it has this incredible power to mainstream cycling to get people that never bike onto a bicycle. And I think it works because it's inexpensive and it's hyper convenient. So you have bike share stations every two, three, four hundred meters or yards throughout a city. And it works because if we're done with this and there's a bike share station right out the door, you probably will take it to get to public transit or to your next destination if it's that close, especially if it's free. So unbelievably transformative. In Boston, in our first season, we had a four-month season. We had approximately 142,755 trips, uh, 3,750 members. Um, right now, we're looking at expanding the system. And uh, right, this is our current system. And one thing we said is we need to be downtown. Uh, we need to be in the medical area. And we wanted to be in two neighborhoods. And we chose two neighborhoods of pretty mixed income to make sure it's representative of the whole city. We're looking at adding another 30 stations this year. And the system's going to jump over the river to our neighboring municipalities. Uh, and we might be double the size shortly. So how does bike share work, and what has it done? It's actually succeeded in doing exactly what we had wanted. It is mainstream cycling. We did a survey of people when they signed up for bike share. And what we found is they sort of bike, 
But biking is the fourth most common mode of transportation they're using. These are people that use public transit, they use their cars, and they walk. And we're getting them on a bike. I thought this was an interesting statistic. Uh, the number one reason by a lot w of why they were signing up was that it was the fastest way to get around town. But what I found when we asked them afterwards, we asked them specifically about a trip, why did you take a bike for that trip? Yes, it was faster, but they also said for fun, for enjoyment, for the environment, for health and fitness. And in, I, in the world of children's, program, pr children's programming for television, they have a term called stickiness. And it's, if a kid is watching a TV, how engaged are they? And uh, what that says is this is highly sticky. There's four reasons that are compelling people to use these bikes. It's succeeding in getting uh, people out of their cars. 11% of the trips replace motor vehicle trips. We want that number to go up, of course. And we always said we need it to be multimodal. 39% of the trips were used in conjunction with public transit. And lastly, this one was a complete surprise. I calculated that $3.4 million was spent by people on Hubway bikes, and that's in a four-month period. And what we found is that uh, about 29% of trips, on 29% of the trips, people spent money. When they spent money, they spent $83. So system-wide, that's $24 per trip. And what's great about this is when you're on a bike, you are shopping locally, and you're supporting your local shops. So for the mayor, there's three things that were really important with, with bike share. One was, again, this equity piece. So, uh, and I know there's a bunch of you from the CDC here, so I want to thank you. Uh, with the grant from the CDC, we were able to support 600 subsidized memberships, which cost $5. And I have a, a program manager that is working uh, pretty much every day to sell the subsidized memberships and get people interested. It's very hard to do, uh, but she's going out to all the churches, all the community groups, all the neighborhood groups, and doing membership drives. Um, number two was safety and helmets. So um, one thing we saw quickly is our citywide helmet rate is about 72%, but with bike share it was only 30%, and we knew that had to change. So we worked with CVS, Walgreens, and all our sponsors, and have 37 sites that now sell bike helmets for $7.99 to $10. And what we knew is we needed them to be accessible, and we needed them to be low cost. But that's still not good enough. So uh, I worked with uh, a, a team from MIT approached me. There were some senior students in their capstone class, so they had a semester project to do. And they approached me and they said, hey, Nicole, can, you know, is there a project we can do? Do you need like a bike component made or something? And I said, ah, they're MIT students. They've got four months. I said, you know, I, I, what I could really use is um, a helmet vending machine that you swipe a credit card, you get a helmet, you take it, uh, you return it on the backside, it cleans itself and gets back into the system. So, and here it is, <laughs> and there's the helmet. So we're hopefully launching these this June, um, and I have to say I wasn't the least bit surprised. I had an intern from MIT uh, last summer, and uh, she comes up to me one day, she's like, hey, Nicole, do you mind if I take next week off? I've got to go to Florida. I said, sure. She says, well, um, actually, you know, I have to go, NASA wants to launch my satellite. Um, I, I said, actually, I can't spare you. I've got some very important data entry to do. <laughs> so uh, the third piece that we needed to really up before bike share was the enforcement piece, uh, getting our police to work with us, not against us. This photo, I want to point out, is not Boston. Um, in the spirit of good humor, it's New York City. <laughs> so, um, And what we did is the police started uh, pulling over cyclists that were running red lights, they'd give them helmets, they'd give them a ticket, they gave out 279 tickets to cyclists. They also pulled over drivers that were parking in the bike lane, and they gave out 978 tickets to drivers. Um, with their help, we distributed 5,126 helmets. So, milestone two, this year we installed our 50th mile of bike lane, and it's been steady increase every year, 15 to 20 miles. By the time you hit 50, you can see you have a network that really helps you connect and get around town. And I showed this earlier today, but each one of these colors represents a year. At first, I'd get a lot of calls, hey, Nicole, are you crazy? Like, these bike lanes start and then just end. 
Uh, and that's the way it goes, but after four years, they all connect. So I did some statistical gymnastics, and given where we started with 180 feet, we've had a 1,523.3% increase in bike lane mileage. So one thing to put in bike lanes, but the second is to make sure they have high impact and quality. So Mass Ave is our busiest surface street in the city. It has 50,000 trips per day. It's a major commercial district, and sadly, it had the highest accident rate for cyclists in the city. We had over 226 accidents in, an, uh, I think, in one year. And uh, I think by our fourth year, uh, I worked with the mayor and we worked with the community, and we removed 77 parking spots along the street to install a bike lane on both sides. Harbor bike, we added a bike lane along the entire waterfront. Again, it's opening up the streets to tourists, to residents, to really enjoy a new recreation area. And downtown, this was our first year we actually got into downtown. And uh, who's been to Boston? That's fantastic. Who got lost in Boston? <laughs> I think the same number of hands. So uh, Boston is very confusing. One-way streets, narrow, tight. Uh, it was a huge accomplishment to be able to add bike lanes downtown. And then we said, well, bike lanes are not enough. We need wayfinding in downtown, because even I can't find myself around. So I worked very hard with our engineers at Tool Design Group, and they're here in the audience. And we came up with a, um, what I think is an uh, ingenious uh, and very clear signage plan. <laughs> Whoops. There it is. <laughs> uh, and that's going up hopefully this month. So lastly, bridges are key to Boston, and we've got bike lanes now on all of the main bridges. Um, so I have to say, uh, the, the bike lanes is really a team effort. And uh, for, as we were hitting the 50 mile mark, I'd get a call down to the mayor's chief of policy and the transportation commissioner every day. And they'd say, Nicole, Nicole, where are we? How close are we to 50? And then they said, Nicole, Nicole, can we get like a thermometer that you know, tracks how far we are? And I'm thinking, oh my god, I am so busy. I've got to make you guys a stupid thermometer <laughs> that's tracking our miles. So we hit 50, and I presented them with their very own personalized thermometer. Uh, there are my two bosses. Uh, and if you, don't, if you email me tomorrow and I have an out-of-office email, I've been fired. <laughs> so network plan, this slide has never managed to um, format itself very well, and I don't know why. But it, in addition to creating all these bike lanes, uh, our fundamental philosophy was just start already. With that said, we knew we did need to plan. So we are nearing completion on our bike network plan that will guide our development for one, three, five, and 10 years down the road. And with the network plan, one thing that was really key was we need to be thinking about the low stress environment, people that don't bike, our grandmothers, our grandparents, people that are very concerned about riding on the street. And what we came up with was 100 miles of multi-use path off-road separated from traffic. 64 miles of separated cycle tracks. They're on street, but they provide separation. And this needs to be the bulk of our, bulk of our system. Um, 86 miles of bike boulevards, neighborways, again, very low stress environments. And then we round it out with bike lanes and shared lane. We'll get a total of 417 miles eventually. Um, another thing that I've been really excited about uh, is the business development aspect. And I would go to conferences like this, and I heard Portland always talking. And they have the statistic that they have 90 to $100 million per year of economic impact due to their bike programs. And I said, we need to do that in Boston. That's a tremendous number. Since we started our program, we've had 12 new bike industry companies start up in Boston. And these run the gamut from retail shops to engineering firms to manufacturers to the Hubway program. Uh, we have now a new bike innovation hub. And this was something we worked on for a couple years. But we have six bike companies that have a shared space that's probably 20,000 square feet in downtown Boston. And that's intended to be a cultural hub that will build on itself and start inviting in a lot more bike companies. And this is a very conservative estimate, but we've probably added about 200 direct jobs in the bike world. This doesn't include part-time jobs. And we have a bike-friendly business program. We're working with all of the main businesses in Boston, not bike companies. Uh, and we award them points based on 
bike friendly practices that they participate in. Uh, this year we rolled over our 100th bike friendly business award. And when you think about it, each one is doing a lot of very small things, but when you add it up together, uh, they are really changing the culture in Boston. Events, key to any program. We have the mayor's citywide bike ride that has about 5,000 riders. After we added the first professional race in Boston in 20 years, the Mayor's Cup Pro Race. Uh, I started the race, but I have never finished it yet. Um, and then our community bike programs, I think, is really the third pillar of what we've done and one that I'm, I'm most proud of. Again, thank you to the CDC because it was a grant from, from you guys that we've worked on. And so uh, it was stimulus money. There was a stimulus grant that came out a couple years ago, and I started writing this great application, and you know, words were flowing off my pen, and I was promising all these amazing things, and I said, we're gonna you know, refurbish and collect and donate 1,000 bikes and work with 10,000 youth and uh, have farmer's markets with bicycling, and then I got the grant. And I said, oh my God, what do I do? I don't know how to do any of this. So uh, I hired, um, well, I did the only thing I knew what to do. I hired someone much smarter than myself, and he's worked tremendously hard. We just donated our 1,088th bicycle. Uh, all go to low-income residents in Boston. Most of them either live in public housing, are homeless, or part of some uh, unemployment-type program. And when I thought about it, that's, that was one of the hardest programs we had because I thought, one, we have to collect 1,000 bikes. Where are we going to get 1,000 bikes? And we set up with all of the suburban bike shops, uh, we set them up as collection points and people could donate bikes out there. And there's a lot of wealthy suburbs, so we focused on them. Uh, and then we'd bring the bikes in and we'd have our staff, uh, a bunch of uh, part-time mechanics would fix them up. And then we worked a lot with public housing and every social service agency and always gave out the bikes in groups because it'll reinforce the usage of it. Uh, we worked with 7,773 youth. All of these programs were on a bike. That was one of our rules. And each kid received four hours of training. And we absolutely wanted it on the bike. We said, being in a classroom, uh, talking for an hour about bikes, that's not going to change culture. But when I looked at 7,773, what you realize is after three, four, five years of this, you start to hit a critical mass of all students in the Boston public schools. That's, in one year, 10% of the kids in Boston public schools. And then we uh, identified a problem in low-income neighborhoods. There's no bike shops. So, uh, and I, I gave this statistic earlier, there's 250 million bikes in the US and probably 249 are sitting in people's basements with a flat tire. So this program set up at 80 farmers markets in the neighborhoods and people could bring their bike and get those bikes fixed for free. Uh, and lastly, we worked a lot with partners. Uh, we have a motto in our, in our office which is yes. So if someone calls us and says, can you bring bikes to an event? Can you, you know, provide instruction at this class? We say yes. And, and what's the impact? Uh, and I think this is the bottom line, is how impactful are these youth programs? So we did, I had a poor unpaid intern call as many families as possible that participated in our community bike programs. And we asked with the Roll It Forward program, uh, two months after they received their bike, how often does your kid use it? 81% of the parents said their kids use the bike every day or whenever possible. And these kids didn't have bikes before. And then we asked a question about, to the parents, have you noticed any changes in health or weight of your, your children? And 30% actually said yes. I wouldn't necessarily call that statistically significant, but I would say that's significant enough to look into. So um, this is slide number 50, and I have to admit I got tired. <laughs> so what's the future of biking in Boston, and where does the city go from here? Um, number one, we want to expand bike share, and I think every city in the country wants to launch and expand. Number two, we need to finish our network plan. Number three, cycle track, cycle track, cycle track. We need to add as many protected facilities on the road as possible, and it's amazing to see what Atlanta's already done uh, with protected facilities, and hopefully you guys will inspire us. Uh, we want to launch our helmet hub. Uh, innovative bike parking, which I talk, didn't talk about at all, and maintain everything else. So it's a, it's a big team effort, and pretty much every city department in Boston is involved in our bike programs, um, and it's been nice. So I want to close. I did actually just receive a call just the other day from Dallas, and they called and they said, Nicole, do you have a couple minutes to talk? We were just raided by Bicycling Magazine, 
as the worst cycling city in the country. <laughs> and I said, do you, do you have any advice? And we, we talked for a couple of minutes, and finally I got off the phone. I'm like, oh, thank God those days are over. <laughs> so uh, that's my talk tonight. I do have a few slides for you guys of things that you will never see in Boston, hopefully. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it with that, and I know we have a lot more for this evening. Let's give Nicole another round of applause. Thank you, Nicole. So my name is Joshua Mello. I'm the Assistant Director for Transportation Planning with the City of Atlanta. Um, what Nicole doesn't know is I actually lived in Boston during that time period when it was rated the worst cycling city in the United States, and I rode my bike quite a bit there. Um, every year I go back, I'm more and more amazed at what I see there. Um, last time I was there, I saw the Hubway bicycles all over downtown. Um, gives me a lot of inspiration for what we can do in Atlanta. Um, you talked about the watershed year, 2007. Um, I think 2012 is going to be Atlanta's watershed year for cycling. Um, we, had, we, had a lot, we had a lot of positive achievements last year. We, uh, both the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and Community Development endorsed the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide, which is an extremely innovative um, uh, book of, of different innovative cycling treatments that have been used throughout the United States, throughout the world. Uh, we've started to implement some of those um, solutions in, in some projects that are in design and planning now. Um, we've also uh, kicked off the pilot uh, bike sharing program at Georgia Tech, which we're very excited about. Um, this coming year, we have several bike projects that are entered the design and the planning phase, uh, including some that were mentioned earlier. We're going to looking at a buffered bike lane, protected cycle track on Juniper Street in Midtown, uh, buffered bike lanes along Ponce de Leon Avenue, potentially a cycle track uh, in the vicinity of the Ponce City Market development, uh, which is going to be a major bicycle hub for the city of Atlanta with the Beltline Trail, Ponce de Leon. There's going to be ramps connecting the Beltline, Midtown, Ponce de Leon Avenue, potentially some bike sharing stations integrated into the development. Um, we're also working on uh, our Cycle Atlanta plan, which is going to look at the core bike network within uh, the Beltline corridor. And as Nicole alluded to, this isn't going to be a three-year planning process where the plan sits on the shelf after we finish. These are identified corridors that have already been included in the Connect Atlanta plan. We need a workable, fundable solution for those corridors. We're going to work with our partners in Midtown and Downtown and the Beltline and come up with a solution that works for each corridor that's fundable. Uh, and then seek funding immediately to go and implement those, those uh, um, projects along those corridors that will build off the momentum that we have this year. So those are some of the things in store for this year. There's a lot more. I need to introduce the panelists for this evening. Um, Nicole, who you've already uh, heard from, is the first panelist uh, for this evening. She's with the City of Boston, as you heard. Um, our second panelist is Nathan Wilkes. He's with the City of Austin. He's an engineering associate for the uh, City of Austin. He's directly responsible for the planning, design, and implementation of bicycle facilities in the city. And he's with the Department of Public Works. He's uh, born and raised Texan, enjoys gardening, local food co-ops. Um, I learned a lot from Nathan today. I learned about uh, uh, navigating the political and community concerns uh, during the planning process in order to um, uh, be able to implement projects upon uh, funding and, and implementation. Um, also tonight we have Mike Goodnow from the District of Columbia. He's the Bicycle Program Specialist at the District of Columbia Department of Transportation. Uh, he's also uh, primarily focused on bicycle planning, implementation. Um, he's an avid hiker. He said he's actually going to go visit the Appalachian Trail this weekend after uh, our event today and tomorrow. Um, and DC's done a really good job implementing uh, separated bicycle facilities, cycle tracks, and their bike sharing programs, a, a national example. So let's welcome the panel tonight. I just want to kick it off with a, a question or two of my own that I've been really dying to ask. Um, number one is we run into a lot um, of perceptions in the city of Atlanta 
that cycling is an either-or proposition. Either it's for recreation or it's for transportation. Um, whereas I feel like I'm getting a lot of recreation during my transportation. Um, so I wonder what has been done in your cities to sort of deal with that perception and if you've seen anything change um, as you've built more bike lanes over the years. I can make a joke. <laughs> well, first you can drive driving into recreational driving and then transportation driving. Mm -hmm. I think you have a real answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have done a number of surveys. In one of my favorite surveys was we just showed 30 photos. We got about 2,000 respondents of different types of conditions for cycling. So we had some that were off-road recreational paths, some that were on street, no bike lane, some with a bike lane, some cycle tracks. And what we found is that uh, all levels of cyclists preferred the most protected facilities the off-road paths followed by the cycle tracks. And we looked at advanced cyclists, which are the commuting cyclists, and novice cyclists, or the recreational cyclists. They all agreed, because I think Rebecca said it well, uh, even if you're an experienced cyclist, you might as well enjoy your ride to work. Um, so uh, every time someone refers to the commuting cyclists or the recreational cyclists, I always correct them and say they're one and the same. I could speak a little bit to that. Um, what I have heard, I don't know the exact statistic, but commuting transportation is actually a small amount of the number of trips. I think it's about a quarter. So um, certainly it's important in working at a transportation department. We do want people to be on bikes for transportation. But either way, if they're recreating, if they're going visiting a friend, um, it's all the same to us. It's one less trip in a car. And we want to provide that option for people. Um, a slide that I've seen a lot today and at conferences around the country shows the different percentages of the population um, broken down by their degree of interest in cycling under existing conditions. So some of you may have seen this. Um, basically, it breaks down to about 1% of the population being the bold and fearless that will ride under any condition. They're the Nicole. <laughs> um, they're 5 to 7% um, prefer a bike lane. And about 60% of the population is generally considered to be interested but concerned. So they would like to ride a bike, but they just don't feel safe doing so. Um, so what have your cities done to attract those riders and, and those folks who really would like to hop on a bike if they, if they had a way to do so? Well, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, and when, when I think of interested but concerned, I, I think about riding with my mother to a comedy club on the back of a tandem and she was really freaked out the whole time. So it's like, if I can't even bike my mom on the back of my bike, then we have a problem. So what we do is every time we put a bicycle lane in, we think about, well, how comfortable will the cyclist be? If you take a, a fast, busy road and you put the narrowest bicycle lane, which is what a lot of cities will do, and, and even engineers in our own city will default to like, oh, well, that's the minimum. Well, we start exploring making it wider. And it's like, when it, once it's wide enough, then you can ride to the right, and then the cars are further away to your left. Or you can ride next to the person that you're riding with, and it's a more comfortable experience. Or you can put a buffer on it, and even get the cars further away from where you're riding. And it's the same deal as a sidewalk. When you think about a painted line on the ground being a legitimate curb for a sidewalk, most people wouldn't walk there. So I think we had, we're challenged to look at, we are dealing with vulnerable road users, and we need to protect them. And, have something that's strong enough so that their imagination doesn't just imagine a car crossing over a painted line. Yeah, I could add to that as well. I, I think putting in these separated uh, bikeways, protected cycle tracks, says, really gives people a good perception of safety, that they have something other than paint between them. And we're seeing a lot of different users, not just bikes on these. We also, we have a lot of tourists in DC. We have a lot of Segway users. We have pedicabs that are using them as well. So we're getting a lot more people out there comfortable in these facilities. I see a lot of parents riding with their children, which I didn't see five years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good indication that these are wanted, that we should be building these facilities. So our answers were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. Um, a study came out, I think it was last year, that found that um, infrastructure projects that built bike facilities generated more jobs per dollar spent than any other kind of project. Um, I found that really interesting. And I was wondering if there were any other examples 
of economic impacts that you've seen in your city by improving conditions for cycling and by creating uh, more cyclists. And Nicole, you talked a bit about the new bike businesses that we're developing and contributing to the economy and hiring people. Um, yeah, you, you pretty much saw our numbers. Uh, but I think we've hit a critical mass of jobs and a critical mass in terms of developing culture, and hopefully that will grow on its own. Uh, and then the Hubway, the cyclists are spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And cyclists are known to shop locally. So anytime someone's on a bike, they're much more likely to be shopping at that local store than driving out to the Walmart 20 miles away. Those aren't quantifiable, but there are some other numbers. If you build a bike path, uh, the house price, the houses uh, directly adjacent to it go up 4 to 25%, depending on how close they are. Uh, it was uh, in Van uh, the what's the bike path in Quebec? La Route Verte in Montreal, or in Quebec. Uh, they found a 9 to 1 return on investment. So they built a 4,000 kilometer uh, trail. And what they found was they were getting more tourists, and the tourists were staying longer, uh, and they were spending a lot more money. And these numbers can be um, duplicated over and over. Philadelphia, I think, had a path, and they had a very similar return on investment. And in addition to the money staying local, it's the same deal as transit ridership. If you're saving money not paying for gas or insurance or maintenance of your vehicle, um, then it's, it's well known that cyclists, like other you know, transit users, spend less money on their transportation, therefore spend more discretionary income. And that's where the local money comes in. They, uh, happen to shop more locally just because of the proximity that they're limited to, but they also shop more. Yeah, those are both good answers. Um, I don't really have any data in DC, unfortunately. I, I've just noticed businesses popping up, like pedicabs, bike-related. Um, anecdotally, some more bike shops open up, more bike sales. Um, but I have certainly heard lots of good data that Nicole has referred to. Something that we haven't quantified is, and I think probably the most important thing is uh, attracting and retaining the creative class. So people that work in the internet, that people work in high tech, and we know exactly what they want. We know why they're going to Portland, why they're going to Seattle and San Francisco. We want them in Boston, and we know that an outdoors biking lifestyle is critical to keeping them in Boston, and that's probably the primary reason, among others, that we're doing it. Okay, well now we'd like to open it up um, for y'all to ask some questions. So I see Glenn's hand. Um, Would you stand up, please? So I can yeah. Champion. That how important is it that the champion's the mayor? Okay, or a very very high level position. And second, how important, or can you just comment on the money, the actual funding that comes from the city, state, and federal government? Um, in other words, is the city actually putting real dollars into this as opposed to you going out and raising money from everywhere else? Talk to the mayor part first. Yeah. I'll start with the mayor one. Um, you hear about cities where most of their city council, including their mayor, is like in Portland, probably half their council is active um, bicycle advocates, and uh, I bet there would be politically um, detrimental to say that you were against bicycle improvements. I've been going to candidate forums for the last like five years in Austin, and five years ago there was very little education on um, bicycle issues, and just like three years ago our first uh, bicycling city council member was elected. This is not our mayor. And so over the years, like now at this last uh, candidates forum, you know, seeking re-election for the bicycle community, um, that candidate was a household name, and they were all talking about how they hang out with Chris Riley, who's the, the council member that rides a bike. So there's definitely like building clout within our uh, you know, political leadership, but we still don't have like a, a leader like you know, Chicago's mayor, um, but it's definitely moving that way. And, and we're still able to do a lot, but I, I think it sounds like Nicole has some nice uh, leeway as well. I would say the mayor is everything. <laughs> when I got the job, I called the top six bike-friendly cities in the country, asked them a slew of questions, asked for their advice. Every single one of them said, 
make your mayor the leader the mayor needs to lead, they also said get your position right into the mayor's office. It's opened every single door that we could have. Uh, so the most important thing you could do. In terms of funding, Boston's funding has gone from about 450000 for bicycle design and implementation a year to about one and a half million dollars for bike design and implementation. Our three-year budget is about 12 million now or 14 million. Uh, so it's, it's a substantial portion of all the money, but we always want as much as possible. Yeah, I can also speak to the mayor of support. Our previous mayor and the current mayor have been very supportive bicycling in the district. Um, additionally, the previous mayor hired a very friendly bike-friendly transportation director, Gabe Klein, who is now working for Rahm Emanuel in Chicago. And a lot of the stuff we've been doing the last two years, we had those projects, those ideas on the shelf for years. And we just didn't have someone who was willing to take those on and be a champion and really push those through. So Gabe said, yeah, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And we did, and um, people wanted more and more. And we've had a very dedicated city council, two of the city council members, are pushing us quite a bit on bicycling um, and actually have provided dedicated funds each year, 1.5 million that we can spend on bicycle projects as we see fit. Other questions? Back. We have a very contentious issue in Boulder with truckers or just people riding on the roads up into the mountains, riding not single file, riding multi-file, if that's what you call it. So it's a massive issue there, and it continues to be an issue. And recently, last year, the same thing happened. An older couple was uh, you know, flying down uh, from maybe 7,000 feet to 5,500, so they're going very fast. And a trucker came in front, cut them off. The, the gentleman happened to pass away. It was a very sad situation. The truck driver got out of the truck, and his daughter was with him in the truck. She was seven years old, and they were you know, both very distraught. The other side of the story is, after they did some research on this, they realized that the truck driver was notorious for swiping individuals on their bikes. So it's developed even more of a contentious issue, and it's an it's a ongoing issue in Boulder, Colorado. Now, to flip this to, to our side in Atlanta, at least my experience is here, I find it's not as contentious here, and, and maybe other people can comment on that, because I feel like we are, in Atlanta at least, a lot more mindful of the rules um, but it's, it, it definitely has been an issue there, and I feel, interestingly enough, fairly safe in Atlanta, though the uh, roads aren't mapped out as much. One other quick issue that I want to ask you about, and, and maybe you guys could help us edify, um, being around four private schools in the area, in the Garden Hills area, and I see Westminster, Pace, they mean nothing to you, um, AIS, we see massive lines of carpooling, and I think it's, it's ridiculous, and I think we need to continue to educate the adults that are getting in their cars, carpooling their children one mile away, maybe at the most, and it's, it's a sad situation. So in your respective cities, how have you continued to, to educate some of those individuals who look at biking as that's something for children and it's, it's not uh, necessarily in their best interest, at least it's seemingly to educate their children of the importance of cycling? Oh. Well, we have a, what's called a Safe Routes to School program that works with um, the school and the PTA and also the parents. And we try to educate them on better ways, other options, making it safe to bike and walk around the schools, also working with the parents on better ways to drop off if they choose to do so, but also sometimes making it a little less convenient to do that, that you have to stop further away from the school. So if you walk, walk or bike, it's a lot easier to reach the school. Um, but there are always some parents who won't do it any other way, and sometimes they're bringing their child to school on the way to their work. Um, so it, it's just constant effort working with them. Uh, Brennan? I have a good story oh, kind sorry. of in that line. I think it was in Copenhagen that I heard it, and it was a teacher that took it upon herself to change the patterns around the school, and she dressed up as a giant pylon and block traffic in the street and just set up a perimeter. <laughs> but it's back to the convenience thing. People do things because it's the easiest way. If it's the easiest, fastest way to drop your kid off at the doorstep of the school, that's what you do. If you can't get that close to the school and you have to walk your kid the last you know, 500 yards anyway, 500 feet, whatever, then you'll be like, well, maybe I'll just bike with my kid to school next time. So 
I think we have to think about structural behavior changes as well. Uh, I'm one of those that, I guess, go through red lights, but uh, I was hit uh, just from behind. I've never been in too much danger by breaking the rules, but uh, it's, it's the cars that are the problem. And I'm wondering, what, what, how do you do that education? Uh, yes, it's, you know, I should be better about these things, but uh, that, we're not the problem. Uh, and so what, how do you educate drivers, I guess, is the, the, the question. Well, there's this good plot that every city and every community can replicate, and that's the safeties and numbers, safety and numbers plot. And, and it's shown across communities as well. So I think maybe the best thing to do is get a lot of buddies, start riding. But the more cyclists there are on the streets, the safer it'll be for you. And that's when you start to see a lot of the culture change. I, I don't know if there's a quick, easy answer to be seen as a cyclist. I mean, a lot of these things I don't think are intentional and it's just distraction and I mean I've seen the in the last five years I've seen the cycling culture in Austin like it, it used to be a little hostile and you get yelled to get on the sidewalk yeah. even in the urban core and then now it's it's kind of a crazy day if that happens so just because of the amount of cycling that we have in our downtown area now and it's cultural acceptance in our community, like the conditions have definitely changed. And there's more cyclists, so. I would say four things for that. <clears throat> One is bike lanes work because you're carving out a legitimate area for the cyclist so they don't have to weave between the cars. Um, two, we use the media a lot. The more cycling is in the media and the more we can keep it really popular and fun and positive, uh, it's sort of an education for everyone. Three, we do uh, we do try to educate the public. We do an excise tax mailer to every single driver in Boston every single year. That's about 500,000 drivers. Four, I think Hubway works really well, our bike share system, because you're taking people that don't bike, that normally drive, putting them on a bike, and all of a sudden, uh, they're gonna be a little more sensitive to your needs. Okay, Maria. Um, could you please talk about how you collaborate with pedestrian advocacy organizations and public transit groups. In Atlanta, uh, roads, cars do tend to dominate, and sometimes it's hard to figure out the best way to collaborate to get many groups that have somewhat like-minded uh, ideas of how cities should be built. Um, what do you do in your particular cities to build a collaboration so that you have better bike paths, wider sidewalks, more transit, um, and to create the kind of cities um, you have? Oh, sure. Um, well, we have a pedestrian coordinator, um, and also, in addition, we have a bicycle advisory council, which is made up of citizens from each of the political wards and four city agencies. The DOT is one. And there's also a pedestrian advisory council. So we try to get the two groups to work together in that domain. And whenever we have any sort of reconstruction project or design project, we take it to those councils so they can review it and comment on it. We I also have a pretty big um, transit agency, similar to MARTA, ours is called WMATA, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. And we have monthly meetings with them, mainly the bus group. Uh, they come in and I discuss any sort of bike lane issues, any designs I'm working on. Um, how will it interact with the buses? Do we have the right size bus stops? Um, we try to, when we design, redesign the roads, make it safer for the bus stops, make it easier for the pe pedestrians to access it. But it's really something that we're just continually have to reach out and talk to one another. It's a lot of communication, coordination. Um, it's a challenge, especially D.C., very dense, older urban environment. Um, we're starting to with some of the separated bikeways, um, take away parking or a travel lane. That we find there's overcapacity, um, that we transform it. We found, two to make pedestrian improvements where there is full-time parking. We can bump out the curb, so it shortens the crossing distance for pedestrians. So we're getting a little bit here and there and just incrementally improving the whole framework for them. 
And Nathan, I know you talked about road diets, which are when you, you do um, transform a, a motor vehicle or a shared lane into a lane with some, some dedicated space for bicyclists in, in Austin. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Unless you're willing to rebuild the curbs, you're almost certainly talking about the space in between the curbs for bicycle infrastructure, which means repurposing it, whether it's lane widths are changing. We do a lot where we narrow the lane widths. Um, and then we do a lot of assessing capacity on the street. And if it's not the critical point on the corridor where the cars really get choked up at lights, then there's a lot of road configurations that are viable alternatives that provide bicycle facilities, but still safe um, and efficient traffic operations for motor vehicles. So, and, and the same thing happens in Austin for sidewalks as well. There's a big movement in downtown to widen the sidewalks. Hi, um, I got a question. Um, I'm a triathlete and a, and a competitive cyclist. Of course, not as competitive anymore, so I'm over 50, but um, I have a juniors team. And um, I'm from OTP, which means outside the perimeter. So um, I, I went to Georgia Tech, so I don't get hives when I come ITP. But um, <laughs> the, um, the question I have is the statistics we saw from Florida, and I think they're similar in Georgia, I haven't looked up. There's 13,500 registered triathletes in Florida and only 1,500 competitive cyclists. But those are the most road users that are out there. And right now, my Thursday night ride is happening in Roswell. And my son's on that ride. He's 15. Um, and they ride as a group. And do you pay any attention in your engineering to um, thinking about when there's mass rides, is there anything we can do to accommodate or help the mass riders as they're out there? And I've got a comment for this gentleman who got hit by, from behind. I was the guy that was hit by the off-duty police officer back in January. And that was the one time I didn't look back. I teach my kids, you got to look back when you hear it, you got to look back when a car is approaching. So if you're not turning around looking, you're just a bike. You're not a human yet. So the more you look back, I think, is to protect you for that. But do you do any engineering consideration for the mass rides or group rides that are out there? And do you have any policies that uh, you discuss with your uh, potentially elected officials? You know, we actually have it in DC. We do have uh, the Potomac Peddlers, which is a pretty large uh, bicycle group. Um, we have in it, and I guess I've always looked at it, and maybe this is the wrong interpretation, that a lot of them are fairly confident that they take over the, the street. Um, so we haven't done anything special for them, really. I have to look at that. <laughs> I don't know if you two. It's, it's not an issue in yeah. Boston. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, this has been fascinating. Um, one of the issues in Atlanta is that sectors of the city are cut off from other sectors of the city, and the only way you can get from one sector to the other is on a busy road. We have railroad tracks that, that cut off the city north, north and south with just a couple of ways through those tracks. We have highways that cut off the city north and south and east and west. If you want to ride from southeast Atlanta to Buckhead, it's practically impossible to do it in a way that the 60% that you were talking about would consider safe. It's very frustrating. How have you dealt with issues like that in your cities? That's a, that's a great question. Number one, in the short term, you're picking off low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of trips that are happening within each of those areas so you can focus on that. Meanwhile, you want to be planning for the big connective projects. Things like that, they can be multi-million dollar projects. You need to raise a lot of money. You might be losing an entire lane or two on a highway. You might need to bring it, create a cantilever bridge, create a bike path. Those projects can take 10 years. You want to start planning for them now. There's no easy solution, and there's no low-hanging fruit solution to that. Yeah. They're going to be absolutely critical yeah, to absolutely the success. Critical. Yeah, and I, I think Nicole showed earlier that they have bike lanes on all their bridges, I believe, which is great. And then Nathan brought up an example of a ped bike bridge that they built. And we have two rivers that bisect the city on the edge, um, seven or eight bridges that go across. And we don't have any bike lanes on the bridges. We're reconstructing some of them, but it's a long process. And we're trying to widen the sidewalks as much as possible to put a bike path along with the pedestrian path. But we also have railroad tracks. We have large um, hospitals, other barriers that you can't get through. 
Uh, Walter Reed was a big example in Northwest where, where they've actually moved. So we're going to start putting some roads through that area and try to reconnect the grid, which is a big barrier, but it's very long term. Yeah, the Cycle Atlanta study that I mentioned earlier that we're kicking off this year uh, is going to look at exactly those issues. The core bike connections that are identified in Connect Atlanta are those key connections that you're talking about that get you across the highways, that get you across the railroad corridors. And the Cycle Atlanta plan is going to look at five of those corridors and come up with a solution for each one of those that's workable uh, and takes lessons learned from other cities on, on what's actually feasible and implementable. Paul, you mentioned some low-hanging fruit, and I know Atlanta's budget for biking isn't quite as robust as Boston's at the moment, hopefully to change. Um, so I have two questions. One, how do we leverage Sharos, the shared bike lanes, and how effective are they in making people more comfortable riding on roads with cars? And secondly, um, Bogota, Colombia, has been the kind of the leader in Ciclovias, and Atlanta Streets Alive is just one that we have in Atlanta. Uh, there have been several all over the U.S., in Boston, New York, San Francisco. How effective are Ciclovia as an open streets event in creating awareness and encouraging more riders? Fantastic questions. Number one, Sharos, especially in the beginning of a program, I recommend <coughs> avoiding them as much as possible because, we, and, and we went through this in Boston, I knew that if I said, hey, let's just put down some Sharos here, it's a really easy road then the engineers would say, why do we ever have to compromise? Why do we have to narrow our roads? Just flip down some Sharos. So uh, even to this day, the only places we've used Sharos is if we've got a long bike lane and then there's a block where it just won't fit, and there's, but we'll push and push and push to get the bike lane in. They're not that much cheaper anyway than a bike lane done well. Um, in terms of open streets, uh, Sunday streets, I think there's a few core things that make a bike program great. One is bike share, two is cycle tracks and off-road paths, three is these major citywide bike rides, open streets, celebrations, four is individualized marketing, Travel Smart is one of the brand names for it, and I think you get those four things and you're in fantastic shape. Uh, hi, if you are speaking to city officials from small cities with limited budgets, that were, who are interested in having more bicycle-friendly communities, where would you tell them to focus their efforts just to get started? Good question. I, I think one of the cheap things to do is, is <laughs> begin striping up some bicycle lanes. Um, it's really just paint or thermoplastic, and often you can find the space in an existing roadway. If you can't, you can pursue a road diet. Um, that might be a really good way to, to begin. And then the other thing I would absolutely do is get all your elected officials uh, in as big a group as possible on a bike ride for Bike Week that's very public because you need more money and that will eventually build excitement and get you the money you need and the support. Nicole, we can check that box off. Um, I think it was actually involved in a very successful event this week, the Georgia Rides to the Capitol, where she got Fantastic. 30 mayors and elected officials. On that's track. awesome. Uh, I was curious to know about uh, equity efforts. Uh, Nicole, you spoke a little bit about programmatic elements. I'm especially interested in uh, facility placement. Um, how, uh, what are the best ways of making sure that facilities are able to, like, especially bike lanes, are able to get into underserved neighborhoods, especially, um, especially in areas where gentrification has pu pushed people into areas that might not be uh, ideal uh, under engineering circumstances for bike facilities because they're less dense? I'll take a, yeah, some good. so I don't think this is the condition everywhere, but I think a lot of our cities utilize the street maintenance program that is already ongoing. And that tends to be, like in Austin, there's a 10 year schedule for every street to be resurfaced. And I don't think that's the case in every community, but that almost forces an equity um, in our city because we, we assess all those streets for candidacy for bicycle lanes, but I think the others might have some perspective. And, um, well, in, in, in DC, that's been a real challenge for us. Um, some of these low-income areas are not the um, kind of uh, traditional grid networks of streets. So you have some higher speed arterial streets, 
that the cars have to get to. You don't have a lot of options. They weren't built to the right width to put in bike lanes. Um, we have culture in some of these areas that they don't necessarily want it, or the people who do want it um, don't have the time to get involved politically and push for it. So it's something we're working on. We're um, doing it in kind of small starts in a road reconstruction project. We're doing a lot of traffic calming to try to bring the speeds down, try to provide some other alternatives, but it's something we really need to focus on. We've really hit the easy areas in the city and the very popular areas for biking right now. And now we're working a lot with our advocacy organization to get these people involved, show that there's a need, that there's a want for these bike facilities, and to start doing that, start putting them in there. I'm from the generation that started riding the bike to deliver newspapers <laughs> and ended up getting jobs and camps on bikes. <clears throat> in Atlanta, most teenagers live for the day when they can get their driver's license so they can drive a car. Ten years ago, the city of Decatur started a bike sharing program where it said explicitly minors couldn't participate. So my question is, what are we doing to encourage teenagers, middle school, high school students to use all these bike-friendly lanes and features so that we get uh, more young people on bikes? <laughs> our, our community bike programs has been great. One thing we really want to do is increase the age of the kids that we work with, so we work a lot more with high school kids. Boston has a busing program for schools. We'll never get kids to be able to bike to school, but if we can get kids in that 15, 16, 17 age range, that's uh, key. We have our subsidized bike share membership program. Uh, kids 16 and older can use it, so we're focusing a lot on the high schools. And um, we, we're doing our best. It's really hard to try to hire high school kids to be some of the instructors for our, our youth programs as well, and that way we'll create a culture within the city that self-perpetuates. And you're doing a lot of bicycle education for kids as well, right? Yeah, 7,773 kids. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Approximately. <laughs> um, one thing I'm dying to do is start a, um, a high school competitive league. Uh, it doesn't even have to be that competitive, but they did it in Northern California. It's fantastically successful. And cycling is a great sport for kids that have failed in every other sport. Uh, you can even be a little bit overweight. You don't need to be coordinated. It doesn't have to be that competitive against other people. So it's a, it's a great sport for more timid athletes. That must be why I'm a cyclist, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coordinated and overweight. Uh, my concern is that 10 to 20% of our drivers now are on the cell phone, and a few are texting. And I'm curious to know if you have any solutions for that or ways to work on it. <coughs> We have a state law, no texting while driving, and the police enforce it. Uh, it's, it's good to hear they enforce it. We, we also have a law. I've talked to some officers, and they find it difficult to enforce. It's just so vagrantly um, violated. Um, the texting one? The, more of the talking on the phone. That is illegal as well. Um, Yeah, we have a no texting law locally, and there's murmurings of you know possibly a handheld uh, prohibition. But uh, I think the people, political leaders, are looking for backing to take that on. The statistics are there on, on the safety implications. Of that. I'm guessing that wasn't the most satisfying answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here in the front, um, <clears throat> Nicole, in your presentation. Uh, you spoke of multimodal travel with uh, a lot of the bike share users using also uh, public transit and walking. Um, well, here in Atlanta, there are some areas that are well served by public transit and some that are walkable, but not most, I'd say. Uh, MARTA is chronically underfunded and uh, been making a lot of bus route cuts. Uh, the trains have been cut back. So my question is to all of the panelists, uh, how critical a role does walkability in a city and uh, public transit play in the success of your uh, bicycle programs? 
It's an interesting question. Density helps. Uh, I think the number one reason people tend to bike or walk or take public transit is because driving is too inconvenient and too expensive. So uh, that doesn't quite answer your question, but the harder you make it to drive, the more people will bike. And I ended a presentation earlier today, and I said, look, if I could do anything in, the, in my power, I would never add a single bike lane in the city of Boston. I'd put in a congestion charge, a $5 gas tax. I would have ridiculously high parking rates and remove any parking that actually remains. Everyone would be biking, no one would be driving, and I would never get elected for any official position. <laughs> It's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we're about to see many cities that are on the lower fringes of transit and walking access you know, launch bike shares, and we'll see how successful they are. But everyone we've seen so far is that it's transformative. Yeah, yeah and in uh, DC, 35% of people don't own cars, and about 38% take transit, 12% walk. Um, it's really crucial if, if we had so many people driving, there just would not be space available and <laughs> it would be complete gridlock. And the density, as Nicole said, is really crucial. Um, just changing the land use, getting the short distances. A lot of people don't want to walk for more than 15 minutes or so. And biking, you can easily do five miles, but when you get beyond that, um, I've heard in Europe they're starting to experiment with electric bicycles or electric assisted to extend that kind of catchment area beyond the five miles. So just providing these other, these other options. In and, the, oh, go ahead. Oh, in the near future they may ask the question, before you invest in high speed transit, do you have a bike share system? You know, so <laughs> it's kind of the chicken or the egg thing. And, we know that it has you know, huge implications on the culture changing powers of, of bike share. So. And one thing that's happening locally, the Atlanta Regional Commission is funding cities and counties to do last mile, first mile projects where you um, increase the accessibility of your existing transit to bicyclists and provide safe crossing for pedestrians. So I think, um, especially in a city that's kind of sprawled out like Atlanta, it really is key um, to be able to bike um, having MARTA, even if it doesn't go everywhere you need to go, being able to get to it safely from where you live and from it to your destination is really important. Um, Aaron? Uh, Nicole, you talked a lot about how uh, I think being rated the worst city was really a pivotal moment for Boston. Um, so for the two non-worst cities, what was the pivotal moment uh, for <laughs> Washington um, and Austin? And I, I know Washington, you said you had two mayors consecutively that were really on board. I, for Austin, you said you had a council member that was an avid cyclist. What, was that enough? What, was there something locally that, you know, just having them there, it was the right time? I guess I'm, I'm curious, you know, what caused, you know, that pivotal moment for you to start investing uh, more in bicycling? Um, that, that's tough to isolate. I, I know a few years ago when the gas prices went up, we saw a real jump in cycling too, and then more demand for infrastructure. And I, I think we reached a point where we got a certain density of the, the bike lanes, and people started really noticing that there's this network out there, and they started feeling safer using it. That really, they would talk to their friends about it, and then, you know, the advocacy organization pushing it, and. And then bringing bike share on board, I think that was a real tipping point too. Um, the bikes are everywhere, they're bright red and people see them everywhere and think, well, wh why am I not a member? I should join that too, it, it's much better than driving, I get my exercise, it's easy. I think that was a real pivotal point where we've really seen some drastic increase. I think every city will kind of have a different story in that regard, ours was, um, there was a group that made a, the second attempt at a mandatory helmet law for all ages. We have a, a, ch a children mandatory helmet law under 16. But it was the 10 years previous they had tried and then they tried again. And the bicycle community came together and said, this is not what is gonna make bicycling safe in this city. And this was a huge city council hearing, so it was a big public forum about what really has been shown to make bicycling safe. And what they said is that we need engineering solutions, we need facilities on the ground, we need education, we need good enforcement. So that, that really kick-started the dialogue. There was a commission that came out of that called the Street Smarts Task Force that looked into the best practices and it reported back to city council. 
And out of that came the um, revised bike, bicycle plan that we did and, and more support for city staff for bicycling issues and everything snowballed since then. But it, it came from a ground swelling of community support, kind of like a room like this. Uh, so we've heard a lot of really great ideas, programmatic, infrastructure, all these kinds of, you know, kind of sexy, um, I'd, I'd say, ways of getting people out biking. I'm interested in one that maybe is a little less sexy and it's more on the policy side. Um, there's been a, a number of folks around town here that are really interested in pursuing complete streets policies um, for our local cities and counties. And I'm wondering if any of you have experience, you know, either pursuing complete streets as a policy solution or support for your programming or if they've been helpful to your efforts um, or whether they are a waste of time. You can speak to that. Well, we do have a complete streets policy that was passed a, a couple of years ago. And I, I certainly think it's worth pursuing. Uh, we had a bicycle friendly council member who actually really provided the impetus and organized a lot of people around that and got our director working on it. Um, the problem that we've experienced with it is we have the policy and it isn't always communicated down throughout the, the transportation agency or the, the city government. And sometimes it, it's ignored or it's not followed or uh, maybe the policy isn't strong enough where they, we have limited right of way and they'll say, well, we can't fit everything. So I, I think how you write it and how it is publicized, it, it's certainly something we always follow and we always bring up but we have difficulties actually achieving some of our goals from the policy. Yeah, I would say that that's been fundamental in Austin is that we have had a complete streets policy. And I don't know since when, I wanna say it's been in place for at least six years um, and predating the, the modern bicycle program that's implementing things now. And uh, the head of the bicycle program in Austin is notorious for carrying that around and basically any project and you know, we've, we've taken the interpretation that even transportation improvements at intersections to add capacity trigger the policy and that, you know, at every opportunity we're getting bicycle facilities and sidewalks in unless, that they, unless they trip over the 20% threshold and then we come forward and we start talking about what kind of funding can we bring forward to make those happen. There's a, yeah, so our policy basically says that when you're doing a road reconstruction or any other major type of road work, that you will provide sidewalks and bicycle facilities. And the only times you can get out of that is if the sidewalks cost more than 20% of the total project cost, and this is just an example of our city, then you have to put them on one side but not both. And then if the bicycle facilities cost more than 20%, then you don't have to put them in. But 20% of a project is a lot of money. And there's a great website, completestreets.org, if you want to learn more about those policies. There's over 220 communities around the country that have adopted them. Um, and I want to go to some of our questions from online viewers. Hamza's been collecting those and folks on Twitter. Sure. Um, one question we had was, how have you engaged underserved communities in bike route and bike share planning? Um, that people from Twitter. Mm -hmm. Well, for same way we do everything else, we go to neighborhood meetings that already exist. Uh, we ask about locations. Uh, we ask about where, where people want the bike facilities. Uh, one thing that we've found is in the lower income communities, there's less resistance to bike lanes going in. Um, and if we work really well at the outreach and we make bikes available and we make training available, they do get used. So we have a little program support to do. It's still very successful. That, that actually answers part of the second question was, was there any um, resistance from communities about putting in bike facilities in, in their neighborhoods that you guys encountered and how did you get over that? Thank you. Um, also, the last question we had is, is there research on the economic oh, sure. impact that bike share has had on the cities that have implemented, have, that where it's already been implemented? And before, I think uh, Mike wanted to answer the, the first yeah, I did, question about resistance first. I just sighed because, uh, yeah, there's, there's we often encounter resistance. But sometimes what we do, we have neighborhood commissions. There are 37 of them throughout the city. Um, they hold monthly meetings, so we go to their meeting and we talk to them about a project. And sometimes we find out the resistance isn't necessarily the bikes per se. It could be just change in their neighborhood. They don't understand it. Sometimes they don't understand 
what a Shero is, are we taking the whole road? So sometimes it's just communicating to them what it is. Sometimes trucks are an issue or buses. And usually it works out after a few meetings. Um, there have been a few cases where we've had to either put a project on hold or we put it in and we agree to evaluate it. And if it doesn't work out, we'll pull it out and we haven't had to take anything out of the roadway yet. And we'll just see next question. Um, and the last question was, is there research on the economic impact that bike shares um, have had on the, the communities or the cities that have implemented it, them in? I actually don't know of any yet in the United States. Uh, all I know is the spending so far that we've calculated. Yeah. No, I don't know of any either. Um, we did have some people come to us from a foundation who wanted to do some research. And they were applying for a grant to do that research. Unfortunately, they didn't get it. Um, but I, I think other people might be pursuing it in the near future. I, I hope certainly it'd be a great question to answer. We have time for one more question, Joe. Right. Maybe two. Sid. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, anybody here around during the Olympics in 1996? You see how Atlanta came together? We had a Billy Payne, right? And we all came together and we made it happen, right? Um, we need a Billy Payne of Atlanta for bicycling, I hope as well, and I hope that they're here in this room. Um, but I would like to hear your advice as a visitors. Uh, first, first of all, um, back to Atlanta, um, you know, where, if you've done an assessment, where we are now, and do we have the right things in place to actually achieve the plans? Um, so, you know, what do you think we can do in the next 12 to 18, 18 months? I've been here, I've lived here off and on since 84, and I've seen so many plans just put on a shelf and just dusted, right? And then just continue as is, building roads and it's cars, roads and bridges. Um, so that was part one. And secondly, I hope there's, are there anybody here from Atlanta that's actual check signer and budget approver and really gonna commit to making these things happen? Or are we just a bunch of advocates here talking, feeling great? I mean, this is a great conversation. Mind, mind me not, this is absolutely. But I hope that we have the commitment and have the resources from the city and, and government that's gonna have the purse strings. Thank you. So uh, tomorrow we're actually doing the assessments. <laughs> we haven't really been out, or I haven't. I got in yesterday. I've done a little bit of walking around, but I, I don't think I've seen enough to make a fair judgment. Certainly um, the people I've met working for the city, working for the advocacy groups just to turn out tonight, I think you've got a lot of momentum. You've got a lot of able, talented people. I think you've got great things ahead of you. That's what I've observed so far. Nicole, do you want to share what you said? Sorry? Can we let's finish up on this question yeah. real quick? Um, Nicole, do you want to talk about what you said today about the, the Ponce project? I, li I liked what you had to say about that, just how critical it is and what an opportunity sure. it represents. Um, you had a lot of great points. Um, by the way, one at our uh, talks earlier today, there were a lot of city representatives there. Uh, they get it. The fact that this group is here is huge for your city. We did this in Boston it changed the city because it got the advocates on the same page as the city officials that are making decisions on the same page as the funders. And uh, everyone came away with so much more knowledge and we've been able to use that. So th this is huge for your city and hopefully a great beginning. Uh, number two, uh, one of the suggestions, you have a lot of wide streets with high speed traffic uh, and a lot of overcapacity. I can guarantee you having been in LA and been in Boston, you can have a lot more traffic, so you can get rid of lanes and add really comfortable bike lanes. But a five foot painted bike lane next to some of these four lane roads is not gonna get enough people biking. So you need to remove a lane, put in a buffer. Um, you have a $25 million investment or grant for uh, a 1.5 mile improvement on Ponce Road. And that is <laughs> the most amazing amount of money uh, and you can do so much with it. That is literally gonna be the crown jewel of the city's bike network. You have the ability to put in you know, raised cycle tracks on both sides, connect it with a bike path that's in the planning, connecting it with a bike uh, mecca, and you get that in and everything will fall into place. Uh, but don't wait, keep doing everything else too. 
Thank you so much. Um, that wraps it up for tonight's program. Please join me in thanking Nicole Friedman, Nathan Wilkes, and Mike Goodnow for sharing their ideas and challenging us to transform Atlanta into a better biking city. Thank you also to Commissioner James Shelby. It was a real pleasure to have you with us tonight and today during the workshops as well. And Josh Mello from the City of Atlanta and to Via Cycle, um, which if you haven't had a chance to check out this gorgeous bike, please come and take a look at that. And I'm sure Sid would be happy to tell you all about it. And Georgia Tech for being here tonight. On behalf of the Blank Family Foundation, I invite all of you to get involved directly in the Better Biking Movement. At the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition, we're doing this not just because we love bikes, although we do, but we believe biking is a great tool to create a happier, healthier, wealthier, more sustainable city. And I hope that's something that we can all get on board with. And you can start by joining the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition. Our membership doubled last year, and we hope to double again next year. Membership information is on your program, or you can visit us at atlantabike.org. We're getting ready to celebrate May, which is National Bike Month. We'll have the Beltline Bike Tour, which is a fantastic way to experience the city, 42 neighborhoods, um, a, a work that's it's going to be transformational. I know you've heard it before, but it really is true. So you can experience that. And then May 20th, Atlanta Streets Alive, our Open Streets event. We hope to see you all in May. Um, and you can also participate online via the National Bike Challenge. And Free Flight is here in the room, one of our sponsors. And we also are very pleased to um, get started on our bike share feasibility study. We have Robert and company in the room. Brad, he'll be working on that. Um, and we really thank the Blank Foundation for investing in this real opportunity to innovate in Atlanta, use some homegrown technology, and um, really see some of the impacts that we're seeing in other cities. We want those here. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.